Hello, my name's Joel Hargis with the Florida Aviation Network. Today, we are at Spruce Creek Fly-In Community. And this is just a beautiful fly-in community with a beautiful 4,000 foot asphalt runway. I think it's 175 feet wide. It's really wide. And I'm here with Keith Phillips. And we are continuing our Veteran Flyer Series. And I'm really excited to uh, to talk to Keith this morning because he's got a great story. Keith, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm we're great, and it's a beautiful day. And so um, that's a nice airplane you have, Joel. Thank you, thank you. I uh, yeah, I got to fly in here this morning, and uh, yeah, taxied right up to to your hangar here. What a what a great opportunity. So we want to kind of take you back memory lane, okay? I, put, let's turn on the Wayback Machine, and so I know you've been flying over 50 years. I know you have a Master Pilot Wright Brothers Award, and that those are unbelievable credentials right there, but let me, let's go to the beginning. What got you interested in aviation? Well, it goes like this. I, uh, I was born in Kentucky uh, in 1935 in the western Kentucky, and my mother was a uh, divorced, which is unusual in those days, had three kids, dirt poor, and we lived with my grandfather. And uh, so in 1942, after I'd been to the first grade, the war was going. So my mother moved to Michigan to work in the factories. And throughout the war, we lived in different places, mainly out on a farm. Then after the war, she got remarried, and we moved to a little town called Napoleon, Michigan, which is west of Detroit, about 70 miles, 10 miles southeast of Jackson, Michigan. And I had a paper route there, and I delivered papers to the local grass airport called the Mall Field, which was BD Mall's airport. And then I started working there and grew up basically at the airport. So I learned to fly. It's kind of like a farmer kid learning to drive. I don't remember learning to fly. No kidding. So the Mall Airport, it, and for those of you who know or don't know, a mall is a type of aircraft. Were yeah. they made there, or is that no, a coincidence? He, he, he built the first ones there, but they in 68 they moved to Moultrie, Georgia, where they're still operating. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so you worked there at the airport? Yes, I did. I uh, worked there just as a youngster and all the way through uh, high school and the first year of college, and then I left home and went in the Air Force. So... Um, so that's where you started your flying lessons? Did you get your private pilot there? Uh, yes, I, I really never had official lessons. It just bummed a ride here and there. And then I made enough money uh, with a little help from BD Mall. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, I bought an old J4 Cub. So that was where I got most of my initial experience. And so is that what you soloed in, a Cub? Yes, I soloed that in a J4 Cub. That's the Cub Coupe, the side-by-side. -side oh, okay. Variant. Yeah. All right. So, there you go, and you were what, probably 16? I was 16, yes. Man, I love it, and did you get your pilot's license like near your 17th birthday? Uh, well, actually it was a bit later than that, and uh, then I kind of let it last because I went off into the big bad world and went to, uh, to join the Air Force and went to U.S. Air Force pilot training in 55. In 55, so you went in the Air Force to be a aviation cadet? Yes. And so what? Did the Air Force start you flying in? We started out in a PA-18, which we got 20 hours, which was great for me because I had... A PA-18, so is that... Super Cub. That's a Super Cub. Yeah, okay, Super Cub. okay. Yeah. Tail dragger? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then uh, we got 120 hours in the T-6. Huh? Yeah. How'd and you like flying that T-6? Oh, it was the first serious... Big, I was going to say big step from, yeah, a, yeah. from a Cub. Big, huge. I, I had a lot of time in 65 horse this and 75 horse that. But that was the first serious airplane that I flew with a heavier wing loading and so forth. And so is that where you started probably aerobatic training yeah. and formation? Uh, we didn't do formation uh, in primary. We did that later. But I already had formation because Ray Mall and I had cubs together, so we, we learned. We taught well, ourselves how to do that. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I know you still do a lot of formation flying, but we'll get to that. Okay. Um, so you, you, you graduate from the T-6, you get your wings. No, 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 that's just half of it. 
Oh, okay. And, and uh, you, well, you start out three months at Lackland to teach you to be a cadet. Yeah, that's pre-flight, they call it. Then you have primary, which is basically six months, and then you go into basic, or which then you after that you get your wings. So the, I moved down to Del Rio, Texas, and uh, flew the T-33, and that's where I got my wings in commission in uh, June of '56. Help us understand a T-33. I'm not. Is that you're not? That's not a jet yet, is it? Yes, it is. That's, is it? Well, okay. that's the first. Remember the first jet fighter we. Uh, that we had in production was the P-80. Okay. Well, that's a two-seat variant of that. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah most, I know what a P-80 most is. Most all of us, if we're old and gray, have all flown the T-33. Okay, <laughs> all right. And so uh, and so that's what you got your wings in. Uh -huh. And did you do some aerobatic stuff then? Well, yeah, you do. Well, you do aerobatics all the way through. The T-6, you teach aerobatics. They just don't teach you formation. But when you get into T-Bird, then you do aerobatics, but also formation. Yeah, you do serious formation all the time. All right, so got your wings. Um, probably time to earn your pay, right? They, what was your first, uh, where were you stationed, and what did you fly for active duty? Well, I was active duty then, but I just completed pilot training. I was sent to Luke Air Force Base to fly the F-84G. That's the straight wing version of the airplane. It was the last Republic straight wing airplane fighter, but it was also a nuke bomb carrier. It carried the Mark VII, uh, although we didn't do that in training. It was just, that was a combat crew training. And when I finished that, which was about four months long, uh, I was stationed in Albany, Georgia, flying the F-84F, which is the bent wing version of that. And in those days, uh, SAC, Strategic Air Command, had fighters. And so I was a SAC pilot for a year. Where were you stationed then? In or? Albany, Georgia. In Albany. Turner Air Force Base in the 31st Strategic Fighter Wing. And so uh, you've obviously got to fly some combat? Well, later in Vietnam. Okay. Yeah. And, so and tell me, bridge that gap for us. And Well, in June of 57, SAC got rid of all their fighters and gave them to the National Guard, basically. And then we switched over to the Tactical Air Command, and we got F-100s. The Super Saber. Yeah, and I've flew the 100 for a long time, a couple thousand hours. I, I know a couple Super Saber pilots, they, they rave about that airplane. Yeah, but then really it has adverse, had really bad adverse jaw and pretty bad flying characteristics. Really? Well, the entire Century Series, we sacrificed just about everything for speed. Ah. And it wasn't until John ah. Boyd invented the energy maneuverability and where we could compare them directly to each other and to MIGs that we found out they weren't nearly as good as we thought they were. When we were at the bar, you know, we told everybody we were flying the greatest airplane. But <laughs> Well, at the, at the time when it first came out, it was one of the best ones, but it, well, it was, in retrospect, maybe not so much. Well, it was uh, significant in the fact that it was the first fighter that flies straight and level supersonic. You uh, didn't have to dive. It would go, supposed to go 1.5 Mach. I'd never got one going that fast, but... Maybe 1.35 or something like that. So where do you go from a Super Sabre? At, and, what year, and what year are we at here now? Well, that was from 50, uh, 57 to 62. And then a, a drastic change in my life. Uh, in 62, during the Cuban crisis, I was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division for 18 months. Uh, and that was a roles and mission issue. Uh, during the Cuban uh, fracas, we found out that we did not have a, uh, a tactical capability anymore. We'd sort of forgotten about supporting the Army and that sort of thing. Uh, so this was a big move by the Air Force to get back and get into the missions that we were supposed to do. And, and we were, everything was orientated towards the nuke bomb prior to that. Right, we, we, right. I spent a lot of time Cold setting, War. Yeah, I spent a lot of time setting nuclear alert in Turkey and Aviano, Italy, and places like that. Really? Yeah. And in and, and the Super Saber still. Yes. All right. Yeah, we carried a Mark Seven bomb originally, and then we got our later one, and we carried it on the left inboard pylon, and then we got the Mark 28, which was a, a more streamlined bomb. We carried it center line. Okay. So, flew that Super Saber for, like, sounds like five years, and then what'd you get into? Well, I continued to fly the airplane while I was in at Fort Campbell, and since we were being punished for spending all that time with the Army, they give us our choice of assignments. 
I ended up at Fort Campbell because I'd been through Army jump school, and they thought I liked the Army. I really didn't, <laughs> but I had three tours with the Army. <laughs> but at the end of the tour, uh, we had our choice of assignments, and the Germans had just bought 850 F-104Gs. They put 100 of them at Luke Air Force Base. So I said, that's where I want to go because for two reasons. All fighter pilots wanted to fly the 104, and secondly, it didn't have a refueling probe. So you knew I wasn't going to go anyplace. <laughs> oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no refueling probe. So, yeah, yeah. You, you had to come back home. or yeah. it get, You weren't going very far. I, I get it. wasn't going very far. Was that a gas hog, that 104? Well, not as bad as 100. It was very much more fuel efficient, but ex much faster airplane. Right. Probably yeah. a little more maneuverable, too. No, no, it wasn't as, no. Not as maneuverable. Oh, okay. Well, you only had seven feet of wing. Oh, Okay. Uh, yeah, seven feet of wing on each side, and the fuselage was seven feet, so the wingspan was 21 feet. So I know at some point they sent you to Vietnam. Well, that was in 66. All right. And that, once again, we're playing roles in missions, and that's when they decide to send Army divisions over and try to make a real war out of it. And since I had all that wonderful experience in the Army, I was – picked to go over with the 4th Division out of Fort Lewis, Washington. They were reconstituted out of there as a brand new division. And so I spent uh, my first tour with the 4th Division in Vietnam flying the 01. The, well, that's the bird dog, the L-19. Okay. It's a Tell me more about that. Well, it's a... Oh, like the bird a, dog. That's yeah. a recon Bird dog, aircraft. yeah. Well, we use it as a forward air controller. Yeah, okay. But all my fighter pilot friends and I, we call it the Lightning 1-9. That was not quite so demeaning when you're at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> all that time, all that Super Saber time, you get back in a 172. <laughs> yeah, that's Isn't about that right. Crazy? Yeah, yeah. Well, then I got my uh, dignity back, and I flew a tour in 100s uh, at a 2 in 67. Really? And what was that plane again? The Saber, Super Saber. A Super Saber again. Went, yeah. Oh, well, back in the old Well, Super I went Saber. back to the Super Saber. Well, I know they, I knew they in early Vietnam, that was... Well, it was the mainstay. It, yeah, it the wasn't fighter. until the F-4 came along. Right. And I'll tell you, we actually used them up north for a while, but they were no match for the MiGs. Right. And Not so, so much the MiGs, the AAA was really killing them. And the, the, the first wild weasel airplanes were actually F-100Fs. Okay. A little known fact, but we... We built six of those, and we lost all of them. Oh, wow. So they said, well, we've got to do better. That's when they brought the 105F, the two-seated 105, into the weasel program. Right. And so did you fly the F-4 then? I flew the F-4 three, three missions in Vietnam, getting an in-theater checkout. Three whole missions. Oh, yeah. Well, I just they were just transition because the wing commander had been one of my commanders at, at Albany, Georgia. And I said, get, uh, this is when I was with the, with the Army. I said, get me out of this assignment. <laughs> so he said, well, come up to Da Nang, and I'll check you out in the F-4. And, but about the time I, I got ready to really start flying the airplane, he, one of his guys had a short round, which means they killed some people who weren't supposed to kill. And, and he got fired, so there went my F-4 job. Opportunity. Which I wasn't necessarily unhappy about. I didn't like the F-4, primarily because of that witness in the back seat. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Most of us, the witness like, like in this the back guy, seat. Most of the, most no Rio for you, huh? <laughs> most of these, most of the guys that are fighter pilots don't. They weren't really happy about the F four when we got it because of the back seat. No kidding. Actually, it was really a hog. It really was. Yeah, I I know yeah. they were fuel yeah. guzzling and yeah, they didn't. They did, sh certainly wasn't very good in a turn fight. I mean, it, well, they, they weren't very good at anything. They were reasonably. <laughs> The F-4 guys don't like me to say that, but I was not pleased. I, I had quite a bit of time in 104 the first time I flew it, and I, I was expecting big things, but I was, I was sorely disappointed. Huh. So what did you fly next? Well, then as soon as uh, I left Vietnam, the Germans, we, we, the U.S. Air Force, had never had a fighter weapon school, which is in the Navy vernacular is a top gun. Top gun, yeah. Right. And, and uh the reason we we only bought a few of those airplanes, the 104, we bought a few A models for Air Defense Command, and it wasn't compatible with the Sage system. And anyway, that's a long story. But anyway, uh, TAC had some C models, but they never they only bought uh, 100 each. And the airplane was sold around the world. There was t almost just under 3,000 built, but the Germans bought the most. And I was a graduate of the F-100 Weapon School, so the Germans wanted us to develop a weapon school. So that's I went back to Luke and 
we spent 18 months doing all the IOT and E for the weapons school, and I stayed there until uh, 72. Now, you were a, a Top Gun instructor in in the Ger 104. In in the 104 in Germany? No, at Luke Air Force. Oh, at Luke. That's where they had all their training airplanes. Oh, okay. How how was that? That was a great, great job. I would have stayed there forever if I could have. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, your job's to get up and, and dogfight every day. Well, no, we did all the missions. We did air to ground. We even did nuke. You know, the oh, Germans, okay. The Germans actually set nuke alert with our nuke bombs in those days. Okay. Yeah, carried a Mark 28 and later the, the Mark 43, the later the spike weapons and so forth. Wow. But the 104 was very unique because uh, in 51, Kelly Johnson, the this famous designer from Lockheed went to Korea and said, talk to all the guys that were flying against the MiGs, and they said, what do you need in your airplane? He said, we want one that will go higher and faster than the MiGs. He said, well, I can do that. He went home and built the 104. And, uh, but unfortunately, it didn't fit in the Air, U.S. Air Force mission. Hmm. But it lived in a world of its own. It was, at that time, we basically, uh, the Air Force had a 350 knot mentality we used to call it We'd drive around at 350 knots indicated and the 104 the flap speed's 540 so that gives you an idea of the difference in speed wow so it was it had limits of 750 knots in 2.0 Mach but uh, they weren't real uh, because it, it originally it was an 800 knot airplane okay and it, and it would exceed Mach 2 but it had fixed inlets so the shock wave gets inside and, oh yeah and then you get what they call an unstart or a flame out but in those days, in air to air, you never had to lose a fight because you can disengage from everybody. Right, just yeah, bug out. Yeah, gotcha. So, what'd you do after that, Keith? Well, after that, I was running out of time at Luke. You know, in the Air Force, you can only stay some at a base so long. Right. And I was next to go somewhere. And and let me ask you, what rank were you? At, at that time, I was a major. A major. Mm-hmm. All right. And so, uh, the. Northrop built an airplane called the F-5A and B, which we had and we gave to Vietnam. And then they upgraded that and made an airplane called an F-5E, which looks similar, but is much, much different, better airplane. And the launch customers for those, the Air Force didn't buy any, but uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia were the launch customers. Oh, okay. And so uh, I did my personnel work and I found out that they needed a, an instructor type pilot to go to Saudi Arabia to help them and he had to be a weapons school graduate. Oh. So I volunteered to go to Saudi Arabia, which was a great deal because I got to fly the F-5 over there, flew the F-86 while I was there also. And uh, I managed to parlay that into a, a career after I got out of the Air Force working in the Middle East. Okay. You liked it over there? Well, I flew with the right people and and, you know, it's any of those third world countries, if you slot in at the high levels, it, life is easy. Okay. All right. So you're over in Saudi and you're flying. Was that the end of your military career? No. When I, I had left there, I was actually signed back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky as an ALO, a liaison officer. I was a lieutenant colonel, but I was on the lieutenant colonel list. And... So I was there just a short time, and then all of a sudden they decided to send me to the Pentagon. Oh, and, yeah. And that was because of my experience in Saudi Arabia. And i just come up on 20 years, so I said, uh, I'm going to retire. But they wouldn't let me retire. I had to stay there two years, and then I retired. You got your light, Colonel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, I was a light Colonel when I, did, when I retired. Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah. Was that, and that was your rank? Yeah, that? well, that's when I quit because uh, I, I would have had to stay another year to even be considered for Colonel. But I and knew then probably that, another five at the dang Pentagon. Well, right? the Pentagon, uh, it was not my cup of tea. Yeah, I, I every was, fighter pilot, or any military pilot I've ever talked to ultimately went up in rank. They got sent to the Pentagon, and then they either uh, quit or made it back in a cockpit if they were really lucky. It's really challenging to get back in the cockpit. I, I know so it is. I, I spent two years up there without flying, uh, except I spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia because I was working the uh, foreign military sales program for Saudi Arabia. So every time I'd get over there, I managed to sneak a flight or two. So the Saudis let me fly. I had two airplanes. They had the F-5s, of course, and uh, they also had an airplane called the Lightning, which is a British BAC Mach 2 airplane. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've seen a Lightning. 
So that, that's fascinating. So you, you retired from the Air Force. I retired from the Air Force in 77, and I took a job with Singer Link because we built a couple F5Es for the Saudis, and uh, I, I went back in country uh, to work that program. We built two of them, one at Dahran and one in Tai. So I was a program manager for that, and I had to hire not only engineers but pilots to be instructors in the simulator. And I took the job because I made a deal with the Saudis. I said, if I come back as a contractor, can I still fly the Air 5? And they said, yeah, we would expect you to. <laughs> so, so I yeah, uh, Anything to get back in the cockpit. So I flew with them for another about three and a half years. Then I got promoted. I found out in industry, if you can do everything wrong. If you make money, you're a hero. And I made money, and so I got promoted. <laughs> oh, good for <laughs> so you. So then I had to go back to Silver Spring for a year and. I would have stayed there, but Litton Industries came along and offered me a job back in the Middle East, and I said, no, I don't want to go back. I've been over there long enough, but uh, they made me an offer I couldn't turn down. So yeah. so I went back and spent five and a half years in Riyadh as a, a vice president for Litton Industries. So I know then eventually you worked your way back into general aviation. Well, I was always in general aviation. I never got out of it. When I was home, I flew. And, and uh, in fact, uh, when I was still in the Pentagon, we uh, several of us bought a mall, a new one. And unfortunately, we got in a little bit of trouble with that because it was subsequently sold to the Contras, and we got oh. we got mixed up in that. And Dick Secord was the leader of that, Major General Dick Secord. So oh, I know that. Yeah, guy. yeah. So does everybody. Else. Yeah, all right. <laughs> but I managed to escape. Not didn't have to go to jail. So no, well, that's good. <laughs> That's funny. And so, what? How did you get your way to beautiful Spruce, 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 Spruce Creek. Creek flying community? Well, when I went back with uh, with Litton as a vice president, I was smarter then, and I made a lot more money, and I uh, made enough money so that I could retire and move to Spruce Creek. And when I quit, they insisted that I stay on as a consultant. And so I consulted for about another 10 years, not with them, just with Litton, but also uh, I had eight different aerospace companies at one time. As long as it wasn't a conflict of interest, it didn't. And I had a great uh, great time because I uh, instructed with, uh, I mean, and consulted with uh, General Dynamics, and that gave me an opportunity to fly the F-16, so. Oh, you great. lucky guy. Yeah. How'd you like the F-16? I tell everybody, if you can't fly an F-16, don't give up your day job. It is such a sweet little airplane. Right. Yeah. And, and you, there's no witness in the back. And no witness in the back. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> oh, golly. So you got to fly the F-16. You, you, yeah, you've yeah. had a tremendous career. Well, I've, been, I've flown a lot of airplanes. Yeah. Yes, you have. Yeah. And so I know you own a couple of airplanes here, right? Well, I have. Two or three? No, I have five, <laughs> and a lady asked me why you have five airplanes, and I said I can't afford six. <laughs> but <laughs> spoken like a true aviation nut. This is my, my cousin over here is laughing at yeah, me. Yeah, and we're going to talk to him in a little bit. Yeah. Well, I built three airplanes. And what? Which three? My first one was a Whitman Tailwind, which I completed in June of '66, just before I left to go to Vietnam. I still have it. It's next door. I show it to you. We're rebuilding it right now. Okay. And then I built my SX three hundred, and right. I finished that in ninety eight. And then I built a Pitts Model twelve, and I finished that in 02. So. So, and I know your SX three hundred. That's got a what a three hundred horse IO five fifty. Well, yeah. it was a five forty originally, but now it's got a five eighty. Oh. It's pumped up to four hundred horse now. And, I, and I've seen that airplane. I, we actually did a show with you in that airplane when we did a Jack Hallett show one time. And uh, I just saw Jack the other day, by the way. Did you? I saw him a couple of weeks ago. But um, it's, it's a beautiful airplane, and you, you fly formation in that, I know, all the time. Like well, weekly. usually I lead. Right? Yeah, so I don't So have you to don't go. have to worry about wing, <laughs> right? Got the easy job. You just got to navigate. <laughs> Hold right. it straight and level, right? Yeah, right. That's awesome. And so... So you own five at Whitman Tailwheel, a Pitts Model 12. For people that don't know what that is, like a Pitts is there a very— There it is right there. Yeah, we, well, we'll, we'll That's a maybe shoot right some B-roll yeah, okay. of that in a little yeah, bit. But um, okay. um, it is a P-1 
pits on steroids. Yeah. They're typically like 400 horse. Well, they got a 400 horse radial Russian engine. Now. Radials, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And they are, like I say, a pits on steroids. Yeah, they're, they're a real they're, beast, yeah. They are, and, and tremendous aerobatic. I also have a little S1 pits, which is out in oh, Oklahoma. Okay. Well, it's in Oklahoma right now. My uh, number two son's rebuilding it. Oh, okay. And then we've got a, a RV4 that we're rebuilding. It's in the... I right. uh, number three sons working on that. We'll have to get over there and take some pictures yeah. of those. Okay. So let me, I'm going to, as we kind of wind down here, like, and I said earlier, you know, that you've, you've got the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. Yeah. You also have the, is it the Taylor? Yeah, Mechanics Award. Which is a like a 50-year, I mean, it's, it's very rare, folks, for, for anyone to have both of those. That's just pretty rare. Um, mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and you've got some other awards. Anything else you're proud of there? I've got a list of Well, that here. Bingus Award, I'm a, I was really pleased to get that. I got that from the EAA. Explain what that is. Well, that's an award they give to the EAA person that uh, is contributed to the EAA to sport flying and, and home-built flying. Uh, it's fairly prestigious. I was really pleased to get that because I was on the home built council for three years, and, uh, and that's I, how I, got I know that. you're real active in your EAA chapter here. You've been president like ten years there. Or something. I was nine years president. Nine years yeah. president, and you actually had a youth group help you. You helped a, a well, school or somebody build. Yeah, an one of the high schools here. That was. It's been about three years now that we finished that. And you like working with the kids? Yeah, I did. That was really a good experience yeah and the gal that spark plugged that the teacher is now an emory riddle professor and i just yesterday went over and talked to her aero class nice. she teaches a three 300 aero class and i went over and she has two classes and i talked to him yesterday because you're what less than 20 miles from emory riddle here in daytona oh right? yeah we're closer now yeah, yeah not very far away yeah. well yeah i mean I, I we do uh teaching youth aviation series and i love to go out and talk to the kids and the mentors of those kids. And um, it's, that's very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, uh Oh, so anyway, um, I guess the next question I'm, I'm going to ask you is, uh, of, of all of those airplanes, of all of those airplanes, what, what do you think your favorite top one or two are? Well, it's hard to pick out a favorite when you've flown that many, and because they all have, uh, they're the compromise. Every airplane's a compromise. We used to say that about about the 104. They said it must be a great airplane to fly, and it was a very straightforward, and you went right where you pointed it. But it was a handful of airplanes when uh, airplane when things happened with only seven feet of wing, uh, and so it, it it didn't fit the fighter world so well because it was not very agile. And of course, the agile. The F-16 and the F-15 came along after John Boyd uh, introduced energy movability. Prior to that, we, the, the fighter pilot didn't talk to the engineer very well. He, there was a big blank. He wasn't smart enough to get on the engineer's level. The bomber pilot could talk to him because he could say, I want to go this far and I want to carry this many bombs, and so could the cargo guy. Right. But uh, the fighter pilot used his vernacular like, I want to earn, I want to turn like a, Sierra Bravo, you know, ba bum ba bum ba bum. That didn't translate yeah, to the didn't engineer. Trans- the engineer didn't have that on a slide stick. But once they put that energy maneuverability together, they they built an airplane. Uh, the F-15 was the outcome of which of, is uh, well, it was the outcome of uh, not the energy maneuverability, although it had a lot to, a lot of that in it. But it was the outcome of Vietnam. We found out our airplanes weren't a match for the MiGs. Right. And the F-15, as good as it is, it has a 130 to zero kill ratio, I think, currently. Yeah, I don't think uh, there's ever been one shot down. No. And the F-16 is the same way, but it has, it's been used primarily as air to ground. But the F-16 uh, competed. Uh, the heavies didn't want it along, uh, to come along because uh, it competed money-wise for the F-15. But the fighter mafia, and that's a whole other story, but they were able to get the F-16 going. And uh, Harry Hilliker, who was the father of that from... General Dynamics, he and John Boyd and Christie, who's the, engineer, the mathematician that put all the, the uh, computer work on the energy maneuverability, they built that first airplane, and it was uh, very unique because, one, they moved the G-load 
from 7.33, which was a standard, up to 9 Gs, and they flew it statically unstable with a computer. And right. Yeah, they call it relaxed ability because when you're supersonic and you stalled it, the nose went down, but your center lift moves way back when you go supersonic. Subsonic, it pitches up if you stall it. Hmm. So, but it's a very, very maneuverable airplane. Very, very interesting. What a career. What a challenge uh, that you've... I just, it's just amazing, and that's when I wanted to sit down and talk to you. Well, that happens when you get to be old, because you've been around. And so, so how many years young are you, Keith? I'm 86. 86 years old, and still flying formation, and five airplanes, and uh, no end in sight. Yeah, but Jack Hallett makes, makes <laughs> me, I'm no, I'm no competitor of Jack Hallett's. So for that's 101 years old. Those who may not about. know, Jack Hallett is a good friend of ours that's now 101 uh, years old, and he was a World War II fighter pilot. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, he's, a, he's a great, great guy. But, well, Keith, thanks for giving us some time this morning. Um, you know, you. It's, it's got invited us to your beautiful hangar, and it's, uh, it's, it's just a real honor to come here and sit and talk to you. Well, thanks for coming over. We enjoy uh, you guys doing it, and I watched you uh, in a couple other interviews, you know, over at Leesburg. And sure. I think that's great that we're banking some of this history. Absolutely, and we, we're going to continue our Veteran Flyer Series. Yeah. And I am Joel Hargis with the Florida Aviation Network here at Spruce Creek Flying Community. Stay tuned. we got more flyers, veteran flyers, to talk to. <laughs>